students, and welcome to the lecture on Central Processing Unit, or CPU. After this lecture, we will be able to learn the following objectives. Explain the introduction of CPU. Discuss the history of evolution of CPU. Define the addressing modes. Explain relative addressing and stack addressing. Understand the concepts of interrupts. Describe the instruction and execution interrupt cycle. Let's start with the introduction of Central Processing Unit, or CPU. In order to work, a computer needs some sort of brain or calculator. At the core of every computer is a device roughly the size of a large postage stamp. This device is known as the Central Processing Unit, or CPU for short. This is the brain of the computer. It reads and executes program instructions, performs calculations, and makes decisions. The CPU is responsible for storing and retrieving information on disks and other media. It also handles information from one part of the computer to another, like a central switching station that directs the flow of traffic throughout the computer system. The CPU resides inside a box known as the system unit, along with various support devices and tools for storing information. Just think of the system unit as a container for the CPU. The system unit case, that is the metal case itself, can either be short or wide. It usually sits on top of the desk, often underneath the screen, or it can be taller and narrow. It generally sits underneath the desk and is referred to as a tower case. Let's now discuss the CPU. CPU stands for Central Processing Unit. This is pretty much the brain of the computer. It processes everything from basic instructions to complex functions. Anytime something needs to be computed, it gets sent to the CPU. Every day it is computed. One would think that the CPU would need a break after a while. But no, it just keeps on processing. The CPU can also be referred to simply as the processor. The CPU is also known as processor, computer processor, microprocessor, and central processor, and the brains of the computer. The CPU will repeat these steps and continuously carry out these operations. A lot of people have a wrong impression that a CPU is a command center. They believe it generates all of the commands and the computer will follow those commands and operate. Actually, the CPU will not generate commands for the computer. Central Processing Unit, otherwise known as a processor, is an electronic circuit that can execute computer programs. Both the miniaturization and standardization of CPUs have increased their presence far beyond the limited application of dedicated computing machines. Modern microprocessors appear in everything from automobiles to mobile phones. There are two major kinds of instruction level parallelism, or ILP, in the CPU, both first used in early supercomputers. One is the pipeline, which allows the fetch, decode, execute cycle to have several instructions underway at once. While one instruction is being executed, another can obtain its errands, and a third can be decoded, and a fourth can be fetched from memory. If each of these operations requires the same time, a new instruction can enter the pipeline at each phase, and, for example, five instructions can be completed in the time that it would take to complete one without a pipeline. The other sort of ILP is to have multiple execution units in the CPU duplicate arithmetic circuits, in particular, as well as specialized circuits for graphics instructions or for floating point calculations. With this superscalar design, several instructions can execute at once. History of CPU. The first CPU chip was created by Intel back in the early 70s. Besides Intel, companies such as IBM, Motorola, 
Texas Instruments also joined the CPU market and started designing their own CPUs. At that time, the CPU was so simple that it could only be used on a calculator. During the 1980s, the CPU had a great evolution. The size increased from 4 bits to 16 bits, then all the way to 32 bits. Its functionality and capability also had a substantial improvement, so they gained a great variety of applications. However, the cost for a CPU declined, and that made the home computer possible. In the 90s, Intel played an important role. They developed the well-known Pentium series processors for home computers. Meanwhile, AMD, or Advanced Micro Devices, joined the game and started the match with Intel. CPU Building Blocks The CPU itself is an internal component of the computer. Modern CPUs are small and square and contain multiple metallic connectors or pins on the underside. The CPU is inserted directly into a CPU socket, pin side down on the motherboard. Arithmetic Logic Unit, or ALU. The Arithmetic Logic Unit is the brawn of the computer, the device that performs the arithmetic operations like addition and subtraction, or logical operations like AND, OR. An ALU from four hardware building blocks. Because the MIPS word is 32 bits wide, one needs a 32 bit wide ALU. Let us assume that one will connect 32 one bit ALUs to create the desired ALU. Therefore, start by constructing a one bit ALU. The ALU performs arithmetic calculations and data manipulation, for example, comparisons, sorting, combining, etc. The computer's calculator is a part of the CPU known as the arithmetic logic unit. It holds data and instructions, which are in current use. Control unit. The control unit, or CU, extracts instructions from memory and decodes and executes them calling on the ALU when necessary. This is done by the control unit of the CPU, which sends command signals to the other components of the system. Some important points related to the control unit. The control unit directs the entire computer system to carry out stored program instructions. The control unit must communicate with both the arithmetic logic unit and main memory. Memory Unit The memory unit is the part of the computer that holds data and instructions for processing. The main functions of memory unit are, although it is closely associated with the CPU, in actual fact it is separate from it. Memory associated with the CPU is also called primary storage, primary memory, main storage, internal storage, and main memory. RAM. RAM stands for Random Access Memory. This is really the main store and it is the place where the programs and software get stored. If the central processing unit needs to store the results of calculations, it can store them in RAM. Random Access Memory can have instructions read from it by the CPU and also it can have numbers or other computer data written to it by the CPU. When one switches a computer off, whatever is stored in the RAM gets erased. ROM. The ROM stands for read-only memory. The CPU can only fetch or read instructions from read-only memory, or ROM. The ROM comes with instructions permanently stored inside and these instructions cannot be overwritten by the computer's CPU. The ROM memory is used for storing special sets of instructions which the computer needs when it starts up. When one switches the computer off, the contents of the ROM does not become erased but remains stored permanently. Therefore, it is non-volatile. These are kept in the main store or memory. Did you know 
transistorized CPUs during the 1950s and 1960s no longer had to be built out of bulky, unreliable, and fragile switching elements like vacuum tubes and electrical relays. Now we will study the addressing modes. Addressing modes provide different ways for accessing an address to given data to a processor. Operated data is stored in the memory location. Each instruction requires certain data on which it has operates. There are various techniques to specify the address of data. These techniques are called addressing modes. Indirect addressing modes. In the indirect addressing mode, the instruction specifies a register which contains the address of the operand. Both internal RAM and external RAM can be accessed via indirect addressing mode. The effective address of the operand is the contents of a register or main memory location, location whose address appears in the instruction. Indirection is noted by placing the name of the register or the memory address given in the instruction in parentheses. The register or memory location that contains the address of the operand is a pointer. When an execution takes place in such a mode, instruction may be told to go to a specific address. Once it's there, instead of finding an operand, it finds an address where the operand is located. Immediate addressing mode. In the immediate addressing mode, direct data is given in the operand, which moves the data in an accumulator. It is very fast. Index addressing mode. In the index address mode, the effective address of the operand is generated by adding a content value to the contents of the register. The mode is called index address mode. The address of the operand is obtained by adding to the contents of the general register, called index register, a constant value. The number of the index register and the constant value are included in the instruction code. Index mode is used to access an array whose elements are in successive memory locations. The content of the instruction code represents the starting address of the array and the value of the index register, and the index value of the current element. By incrementing or decrementing index register, a different element of the array can be accessed. Register mode. The name, the number of the CPU register, is embedded in the instruction. Displacement mode. Similar to index mode, except instead of an index register, a base register will be used. Base register contains a pointer to a memory location. An integer constant is also referred to as a displacement. The address of the operand is obtained by adding the contents of the base register plus the constant. The difference between index mode and displacement mode is in the number of bits used to represent the constant. When the constant is represented by a number of bits to access the memory, then one has index mode. Index mode is more appropriate for array accessing. Displacement mode is more appropriate for structure records accessing. Relative addressing. For relative addressing, the implicitly referenced register is the program counter or PC. Base register addressing. The reference register contains a memory address and the address field contains a displacement from that address. Indexing. The address field references a main memory address, and the reference register contains a positive displacement from that address. Stack addressing. A stack is a linear array or list of locations. It is sometimes referred to as a pushdown list or last in first out queue. A stack is a reserved block of locations. In 8051, we have mainly nine addressing modes, which are immediate addressing mode, register addressing mode, index, indexed addressing mode, to name a few. First of all, we'll discuss immediate addressing mode. In this mode, our operand is an immediate data, which is constant. As you know, in assembly language, 
Immediate operands are preceded by a pound sign as shown. For example, we have instruction move a, comma, hash 6ah, where 6ah is the immediate operand. As you can see, the accumulator is holding 6ah, the immediate value. The next mode we are going to discuss is register addressing mode. In this mode, one of the operands is a register holding the data to be manipulated. The source and destination must be of same size. For example, in this instruction, the value stored in the register R4 is copied to the accumulator. Coming on to direct addressing mode. In this mode, directly, the address of RAM location is given in the instruction. It can access RAM locations from 00 to 7FH. For example, as we can see, RAM location 04H stores the value 1FH, which is copied into the accumulator through the given instruction. The next addressing mode we are going to discuss is indirect addressing mode. Here, register is used as a pointer to data. The register holds the address of the RAM location containing data. Add sign is used before register indicates that the register is used as a pointer. For example, here register R0 stores the value 20H. Using this instruction, the value stored in the memory location 20H is copied to the accumulator. As you can see, accumulator contains 2FH contained in 20H. Indexed addressing mode. This mode used a base register, either a program counter or a data pointer and an offset, generally the accumulator. Jump tables or lookup tables are easily created using index, indexed addressing. For example, here data pointer is holding the address location 01FEH and with the accumulator value 02H as an offset, data stored at location 0200H is moved to the accumulator. The next mode is absolute addressing mode only to be used with a call and a jump instructions. These two byte instructions allow branching within 2k page of the code memory. Within any 2k page, only lower 8 bits, 11 bits change. Next mode to be used is long addressing mode. This mode is used with L call and L jump, and L jump instructions. It includes full 16 bit destination address as bytes 2 and 3 of instruction. Byte 1 is containing the opcode. In this mode, full 64k code space may be used, but instructions become long and position dependent. Coming on to bit addressing mode, as we know, RAM locations from 20 to 2FH and some of the special, fun special function registers are bit addressable. Using some instructions such as setB, CLR, etc., we can access these bits as shown. The last addressing mode we are going to discuss is the relative addressing mode. In this mode, an 8-bit sign value, an offset we call it, is added to the program counter to form the address of the next instru instruction executed. Range of the jumping here is from minus 128 to 127 location. For example, in instruction S jump there as shown, assembler is assigning an offset 3EH as by 2 of the instruction where 1002 plus 3E is equal to 1040H which is the destination address. This mode provides a position and independent code but the range of jumping is limited. Let's now learn about the concepts of interrupts. An interrupt is the automatic transfer of software execution in response to a hardware event that is asynchronous with the current software execution. This hardware event is called a trigger. The hardware event can either be a busy to ready transition in an external I.O. device like the UART input output or an internal event like bus fault, memory fault, or a periodic timer. When the hardware needs service signified by a busy to ready state transition, it will request an interrupt by setting its trigger flag. A thread is defined as the path of action of software as it executes. The execution of the interrupt service routine is called a background thread. This thread is created by the hardware interrupt request and is killed when the interrupt service routine returns from interrupt. 
for example, by executing a BXLR. A new thread is created for each interrupt request. It is important to consider each individual request as a separate thread because local variables and registers used in the interrupt service routine are unique and separate from one interrupt event to the next interrupt. In a multi-threaded system, one considers the threads as cooperating to perform an overall task. Consequently, one will develop ways for the threads to communicate, for example, an FIFO, and to synchronize with each other. Most embedded systems have a single common overall goal. On the other hand, general purpose computers can have multiple unrelated functions to perform. Interrupt hardware. When a device report is ready, a device report generates an interrupt, or when it completes the assigned action, or when a timer overflows, or when a time at the timer equals a present time in a compare register or on setting a status flag, for example, on timer overflow or compare or capture of time, or on click of a mice on a computer. Generally, there are three types of interrupts, and these are external interrupt, internal interrupt, and software interrupt. External interrupt. The external interrupt occurs when any input and output device request for any operation and the CPU will execute that instruction first. For example, when a program is executed and when one moves the mouse on the screen, then the CPU will handle this external interrupt first, and after that it will resume with its operation. Internal interrupts. The internal interrupts are those which are occurred due to some problem in the execution. For example, when a user performing any operation which contains any error and which contains any type of error. The software interrupts. The software interrupts are those which have made some call to the system. For example, while one is processing some instructions and when one wants to execute one or more application programs. Instruction and execution interrupt cycle. It is very important to appreciate the fact that an operating system or OS is just like any other program, albeit a little bit more complex as compared to user written programs. The OS provides the functionality to load and execute other programs and thus possesses certain privileges which user programs do not possess. A user program can and does request for OS intervention through a mechanism called system calls for example, trap, page fault, etc. Once a computer has been powered on, it performs a continuous cycle of fetch next information from memory, decode the instructions, execute the instruction. An instruction, as the name instructs the computer, what to do. In simple terms, every line of a program that one user writes instructs the computer to perform a series of operations. One may argue that the programs comprise of the instructions belonging to one of those of the high-level languages like C, C++, and Java, etc. A computer understands these high-level instructions by converting them into a machine-understandable form, known as machine language, comprising of ones and zeros. Instruction Fetch Execute Cycle A more complete form of the Instruction Fetch Execute Cycle can be broken down into the following steps. Fetch Cycle, Decode Cycle, and Execute Cycle. An Interrupt Cycle, Interrupt Handler. Fetch Cycle, the Fetch Cycle begins with retrieving the address stored in the Program Counter or PC. The address stored in the PC is some valid address in the memory, holding the instruction to be executed. The CPU completes this step by fetching the instruction stored at this address from the memory and transferring this instruction to a special register instruction register, or IR, to hold the instruction to be executed. 
the program counter is incremented to point to the next address from which the new instruction is to be fetched. Decode cycle. The decode cycle is used for interpreting the instruction that was fetched in the fetch cycle. The operands are retrieved from the addresses if need be. Execute cycle. This cycle, as the name suggests, simply executes the instruction that was fetched and decoded. Interrupt cycle. An interrupt cycle can occur any time during the program execution. Whenever it is caused, a series of events take place so that the instruction fetch execute cycle can again resume after the OS calls the routine to handle the interrupt. Interrupt handler. Set the mode of operation as a privileged one, often termed as the supervisor mode, so that the OS can execute the handler. Once the OS completes the execution of the interrupt handler, the address of the next instruction to be executed is obtained from popping the values of the address in the stack. The suspended instruction can now continue with its execution. This cycle of fetching a new instruction, decoding it, and finally executing it continues until the computer is turned off. Now in the end, let us summarize what we have learned in this lecture. The central processing unit, or CPU, is responsible for interpreting and executing most of the commands from the computer's hardware and software. The CPU is also known as processor, computer processor, microprocessor, central processor, and the brains of the computer. Clock rates can be very misleading since the amount of work different computer chips can do in one cycle varies. Clock rates should not be used when comparing different computers or different processor families. Addressing mode provides different ways for accessing an address to given data to a processor. Operated data is stored in the memory location. Each instruction requires certain data on which it has to operate. In the immediate addressing mode, direct data is given in the operand, which moves the data in the accumulator.